This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. And welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 19, Episode 8, recorded and released December 4th, 2011. That's a Sunday, by the way. From a very frosty Pacific Northwest, my name is Chris. And my name is Alan. Hey, good morning to you, sir. And hey, uh, good morning to everybody in the jblive.tv chat room. The uh, live yes, stream is provided 260 by... 260 people. 260 people hanging out with us right now, provide, and that's just because we're just getting started. It'll even go up yeah. from there. Provided by ScaleEngine.com. So thanks to ScaleEngine, that's Alan's company, for mm -hmm. providing the epic live stream, which allows us to stream to VLC players without Flash. So for you Linux fans out there, which I think a couple of you might be, we worked on that <laughs> just for you guys. Uh, yeah. So that's a really great part about the live stream, and it goes 24-7. Also Android, iPhone, iPad, et cetera, yep. et cetera. Yep, we links to all that on the jblive.tv page. Well, we got a big show today. Uh, coming up in the second half of the show, it's the Mint 12 review. I think people have been waiting for that one. And yep. I, I, uh, I have some interesting thoughts on it, and uh, I'll share those with you. And then uh, in the news segment, we've got a story that I really feel is at the core of it about Linux being perverted and turned against its users. So we're going to cover that. And we have some epic picks this week. But my first point of business is I want to give you our runs Linux this week. Now, you iPhone users out there may have heard of this little program before called Instagram. I think it's coming to Android soon. And it turns out the Instagram infrastructure runs Linux. Uh, Ubuntu 1104, to be specific. And they run it on Amazon EC2. They said in their interview, or it's like a blog post or something, they said that we found that previous versions of Ubuntu had all sorts of unpredictable freezing episodes. And they're talking about specifically on EC2 under high traffic. But Natty has been solid. And they only have three engineers. That's incredible. They say their needs well, are still evolving. 11.4 isn't long-term support, is it? Hmm, I don't know. I think it is, yeah. No, I think oh, okay. 11.04 was long-term. Okay. It's just You don't see co corporate infrastructure usually is done on the long-term support versions because they're more stable and, and last longer. <laughs> oh, okay. So 10.04. 10.04 is long-term support. 10.04, not 11.04. Right. Um, so if they're using 11.04, then... Yeah, no, they're I, not no using that's a good point. I think they're just using it because there's an EC2 image available. Well, and they just uh, because their infrastructure is EC2 like that, it's probably easier for them to... Right, right, right. The newer version has the advantage, and they d they're not so worried about when it times, comes time to upgrade. And like the chat room saying, they might switch to long-term support. See, if 10.04 was long-term support, that means 12.04 will be long-term yeah. support, and they could switch to long-term support then. Yeah, because um, uh, I was running into the same issue, actually. It's like, I want to build this OpenStack virtualization infrastructure, but... I want to use the long-term support version so I don't yeah. have to keep upgrading it. Yeah. But there isn't another one. Right. You know, I want the newest well, version of I mean, Ubuntu because in the newer versions, the OpenStack stuff is already in the apt repository. Yeah. So you don't have to... Yeah. It, it, it does it all for you. Well, it's kind of funny. It parallels uh, on this last week's episode of TechSnap. We talked about this massive ZFS server you built that has like mm -hmm. 48 gigs of RAM and tons yep. of storage. And you went FreeBSD nine, which isn't even out yet. It's kind of yeah. you kind of you're kind of in the same boat as they yeah. are in this case. It's a little different, but you know sometimes the newer versions just have that code that you have to that have need, to make it yeah. work. It exactly. might have been their situation. Uh, now I have a I have a really important Android pick this week. Yes. Um, but I'm going to save that for the news segment because it's going to fit with the news story. So I think I'll hold that. Okay. Um, and I. And then I'm going to give you two awesome universal picks this week. But before we get to that, I want to say good morning to the beautiful. Danica Patrick over at GoDaddy.com. And, uh, of course, GoDaddy.com is the world's number one domain name registrar. But what you might not know is they're offering a new deal. Now, we just had that new deal where you could get uh, ridiculously cheap hosting for uh, $1.99 for three months yep. if you use the code Linux11. That's still around. $1.99 hosting for three months. I mean, you know, put your Christmas blog up there. That's just crazy. Yeah. But uh, what GoDaddy is offering, and this is something I always like to take advantage of, is... Free private registration, which that's about a ten dollar uh, a year value. When yep. you register or transfer a domain, there's no quantity limits either. So if you have a bunch of domains you want to move, uh, and you can get them all with the private registration for free. Now this does end December thirty first, and it it works on dot com, dot net, dot info, dot biz, and mobies, and org. You just have to use the code Linux seventeen, Linux seventeen to get free private registration. That's a really great deal. So. Thanks to GoDaddy, because uh, we were talking about TechSnap with GoDaddy, and mm -hmm. I said, you know, TechSnap is extremely security-focused, 
And one of the things that I think would be a great way to go would be private registration. And, you know, is there any offer codes you have on that or bulk transfers? And uh, we're going back and forth on the bulk transfers, but they said, you know what, we can get you hooked up on the private registration and we'll get, make it available for the Linux Action Show too. So check awesome. that out. Use the code Linux17 yeah. and get private registration when you check out at GoDaddy. And thanks to GoDaddy for their support of the big show. For sure. Right. And, you know, the private registration is especially good if you have, if it's, you know, a personal site. If it's a corporate yeah. site, it's a little different. But when it's, you know, just your blog or whatever, you don't want people to have your home address. No, exactly, exactly. All right, I've got two universal picks for you this week since we're not doing yes. an Android pick up top. My first one is a video game. You might remember Marathon. Well, now Alpha 1 is out. And uh, Alpha 1 is a re... One part remaster, one part remake of this classic, used to be Mac only video game. Um, and they're out with uh, a Windows, Mac, and Linux version. They call it Alpha One, and you can go download the entire trilogy over at marathon.sourceforge.net. Of course, link in the chat room. But mm -hmm. uh, they, got it, you know, they got it for every OS, but of course, I know all of you are going to download it for, for Linux, right? Yeah? Yep. yeah? Okay. Now, something the else that's. The chat room is making fun of your pronunciation because it's Aleph, not Alpha. Oh, is it? A yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, chat room. See, isn't it good that we have that chat room around to keep me in check? Because otherwise, yep. I would just go around be all over the place. Yeah, which we ought to call this is the pronunciation action show. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. All right, now my, uh, my second universal pick is one part a video, two parts an announcement, and three parts a cross-platform tool to keep you more secure. Uh, this last Saturday, I relaunched an in-depth look, an old, t an old uh, video series I used to have here on Jupiter Broadcasting. And in this episode, I talk about LastPass and how you can use it to generate complex passwords and keep different passwords for every website you use. I mean, we talk about these compromises all the time here on the network, and it's so mm -hmm. obvious that having, like, a good password is just as important as having, like, a great firewall on your network. Um, yep. you, you know, I had, uh, what was it, uh, Alan, do you remember when the Gawker database got leaked? Uh, not exactly. But I don't either, but when the Gawker, when the whole, uh, and I hadn't used, like, I just, I created a Gawker account to comment on Gizmodo, like, once, mm -hmm. ever, and that yep. password database got leaked online. Well, I had used, like, my low-hanging fruit easy password, which, thankfully, I hadn't used on my Gmail account, but within about 15 minutes of that password database getting online, people were already banging on my Gmail account. They just, they just go for it. They just, now they just script it. And yep. if you use tools like LastPass and generate secure passwords for each site, that's a lot less of a worry for you. So go watch my new video. It's only about five minutes long. And uh, subscribe to the RSS feed because next week, based on popular demand, I'm planning to do a behind-the-scenes tour of Jupiter Broadcasting uh, Studio. If I don't get yes. it done, I'll, I'll put something else out in the meantime. But uh, that's, that's kind of my goal for the next Saturday's episode. So a new episode's coming out every Saturday over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And the first one is about passwords. Like I said, about five minutes long. So it's, it's worth your time. Yep. It's um, really good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I enjoyed making it. It, uh, it was fun to get back into the old saddle because I haven't done one of those in-depth looks for a really long time. And I thought, mm -hmm. it's time to bring it back now that I'm doing this full time and I have a little more time on my hands. All right, Alan. With all that out of the way, let's do the news. <laughs> right, Alan. The top story on the news docket for this week. Um, <laughs> I got I to gotta step it up yes, every now and then. It's a... Big news this week. It is a big news story, and uh, it is it is sort of playing into the overall um, mantra that I've been on that if Android isn't used properly by the manufacturers and carriers, it can be turned against the own com yep. its own community that created it. Um, you know, at the core of Android is Linux, and this week there's been a massive story breaking. This was supposed to be a slow tech news week, just so everybody knows. This week, though, um, the story about carry I carrier IQ broke, and uh, I won't spend too much time on it because uh, a lot of you are probably pretty inundated with the story. But just a quick recap for those of you who might not have heard about Carrier IQ. Um, and, and we are sitting at, a, at, a, at an advantageous position here being a Sunday. Uh, the mm -hmm. story has developed and we know more information than people heard about earlier in the week. Some of that information hasn't been reported on properly. But mm -hmm. uh, just a quick recap. Carrier IQ is essentially um, carrier-endorsed and carrier-installed or recommended malware. And yeah. uh, according to a research, that, but, but look, based on research that's been done, it appears that Carrier IQ is capable of logging basically everything about your phone. The applications you have installed, the applications running, it's capable of receiving your text messages even before the phone notifies you that you've received a text message. It can actually intercept text messages. Um, it's also capable of transmitting your location, the URLs of websites that you visit, and uh, as well as uh, many other interesting details like your location or the applications yep. you're installing, 
and things like that. Um, and even in local mode, if you run it, this guy ran it uh, in debug mode locally, it goes even further on the actual phone itself. It actually, the debug mode even stores what key presses you make on the, on the device. Um, I'm That's showing a video of that right kind now. Kind of insane. It is. It is pretty insane. Um, and it's, uh, it's estimated by the Carrier IQ's own numbers that it's installed on 150 million Android devices, um, HTC being a big one. That's what this video here is, is uh, of the HTC phone. Now, a uh, lot of vendors and, and providers are already trying to step back from this. Verizon said, we don't use any Carrier IQ on our stuff. And uh, Apple said, well, we, we used parts of Carrier IQ in iOS 5 and below. But starting with iOS 5, we, we took it out because, you know, we, we thought better about it. Um, and it's essentially sanctioned spyware. And the yeah, and as the name suggests, they, they built this and took it to the carriers and said, here, have this, and then you can learn about people's app purchasing habits and so on so that you can, you know, sell them apps better. So that's, that's the gist of the story. Here's the update based on uh, uh, reporting done by Wired and, 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 and other companies. But uh, we even have a screenshot here, if you're watching the video version, of what the Carrier IQ dashboard looks like where they get a general overview of each person's phone from their remote location. And uh, they're based out of Mountain View, California, so not too far from uh, Google and the other hotties in Silicon Valley. Uh, mm -hmm. They say that the uh, software, this is from Carrier IQ, this is a quote from Area Carrier IQ, uh, Wired met with Andrew Coward. That's, uh, that's Carrier IQ's chief marketing guy. His last name is actually Coward. <laughs> and uh, he says that the software also monitors app deployment, battery life, phone CPU output, and data and cell site connectivity, among other things. They said uh, they don't uh, store the keystrokes remotely, but uh, the data does get uploaded from the phone once a day and is sent to their servers. First thing I wonder is what about people on limited data plans? Are they well, paying to have their self spied on? So uh, I have on my Samsung Galaxy Tab, I have a 3G 250 megabyte plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, the battery life also sucks on this tab now. And you've got to wonder if something is essentially running in almost what would be a debug mode all the time and then yep. collecting data and then once a night transmitting it, A, how is that impacting my data rate? And B, how is that impacting my performance life to say nothing about the uh, privacy implications of it? Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, just on that, just there, that, that is, that's bad. Uh, but uh, so Wired went out to uh, uh, Carrier IQ's offices on Friday, and uh, th they wanted to see the uh, keystrokes claim debunked with their own eyes. He does, uh, uh, Andrew Coward does go on to say that, uh, yes, they can confirm that the URLs they see captured, even HTTPS URLs. He goes on to justify it that, well, maybe you might want to call into your carrier and say you're having troubles loading Facebook. So the carrier can just look at your phone to make sure that you're not mistyping Facebook into the browser bar. That's, you know... Right, and if some of this data was public, like sent to the carrier in aggregate and anonymized it might be less of an invasion of privacy. The right? anonymization is based on the customer's needs, which the customer in this case is the carrier. So different right. carriers have so different standards. So the carriers, like you said from the dashboard, they can look drill into individuals' phones, which yes. they can probably fairly easily tie to an individual customer. They, and that's, that's where the, the problem lies. The other scary part is they said, uh, we also certainly recognize, and this is a direct quote, we certainly recognize that as a future thing for advertising, clearly having that information from a marketing perspective is very interesting. Right. And, you know, they're claiming they have this treasure trove of customer data. That's their that exact they words, yeah. they want to sell, right? And, and, yeah, that's what they want to do. But, you know, this is basically a root kit on your phone, right? It's hidden and it's very hard to remove. It's actually, it actually is, I believe, at the kernel level, too. Right, because, um, well, to tie into a lot of these things. Yeah. They say, depending on the carrier's needs, they store the data from 10 to 30 days. Uh, if you're watching the video version, here's another screenshot of their dashboard that shows you. Now, here's some diagnostic information that maybe you might be able to find interesting. It tells you, you know, these many drop calls and things like that. Right, um, and sending that data anonymized in aggregate would be fine, but sending every URL I visit, probably not fine with me. So here's the, here's the truth. Sounds like this has been going on for a while. So long, in fact, that carriers like AT, AT&T and T-Mobile have worked in custom support solutions for their, for their support reps to be able to drill into this information. And uh, this wasn't the first time this was uncovered. It was actually uncovered back in February by another Android ROM developer. But he thought maybe it only applied to his HTC phone. So his response was to simply just release a ROM that was essentially the stock image without the carrier IQ information, right? Yep. Uh, then later, the, the guy that, uh, his first name is Eric, I'll see if I can dig up his name while I talk about it, uh, 
he found it by a very interesting sort of organic way. He was an IT administrator. He is an IT administrator at a, an enterprise level network. And he noticed a lot of strange data activity from cell phones on his Wi-Fi network. And then when yeah. he began to run packet sniffs and to, and to figure out what it is, he realized that these things were phoning home and sending information. And that's when he started. Yeah. Then that, from that point, it just led to doing the development on the Android device, running in debug mode and finding out everything that it's doing. Uh, and initially, Carrier IQ responded by sending him a very draconian cease and desist, trying to censor him, shut him up, and yeah. uh, which had worked in the past. In fact, it worked with other developers. Uh, they they pulled all of their stuff off off the internet and fearing you know legal action against them, even though they didn't get a letter. Um, yeah. But uh, thankfully, this guy took it to, took it to the EFF and the Electronic F uh, Frontier Foundation said, <laughs> "No, this is a freedom of speech issue." And uh, our yeah. and then a Carrier IQ, you know. Rescinded. Right. Well, and you know they, they managed they to keep it, it quiet. How much more extra money did they make by keeping it quiet for so long, just by threatening people? And yeah. so, yeah, when you get a threat, you need to know what your rights are and and look into it a little bit more rather than just immediately caving. Now, because uh, a lot of times it's a completely bogus threat. The reason why this gets me so riled up is because it's a it's an example of the open source Linux kernel being taken, and then essentially being turned against it's being uh, not used for evil maybe but where do we draw the line i mean if this was well, right. if this was it's a laptop that came with spyware like this from uh from dell people would be freaking the f out and these mobile devices are our future computers and they're getting in at the at at, at square one with spyware at the right, square one they if, can monitor if you get a if you get a system pre-built from someone else why would you ever trust it yeah right like even if you if you get the laptop from dell there probably is some stuff on there you don't want so now, the difference is with the Dell crapware, it's usually fairly easy to get rid of it. Yeah, yeah. With this, they, they purposely hit it, right? They didn't, you know, call it, you know, AT&T drop call monitoring right. or whatever. And if it and was really for tech support, um, why not make it user controllable? Yes. Like, if I'm calling up and I'm having a problem getting to Facebook.com on my phone, like, first of all, who the hell calls for that issue to the cell company that sounds probably like, a lot actually you think <laughs> I, I would retired. i would rather slam my head into a door for an hour for, than call them over that right but, but you know some people are but okay are not so us. Let's, let's just assume that happens let's just assume yep. that people call and you know they get support why couldn't at that time i just have like a widget that i tap that activates remote support yep if it was really for my benefit and right, and we're, even if they want to have it on by default, you know, uh, anonymized reporting of how you use your phone, and then they aggregate the information, and it's anonymous, and they just get, all right, most people seem to use the phone in this way, or whatever. And here's what... Then maybe, but, you know... The chat room's touching on something, Alan, that really has okay. me pissed off. That? And that is, iOS devices had this issue, but to such a less t egregious degree that it is extremely frustrating that Android, the open platform, is the one that's subject to these attacks. And now Apple still violated user privacy and did these things, but it only activated when you turned on send debugging information to Apple, and you, it, that, which is off by default. And right. it didn't send contents of text messages, etc. Android should be the platform of the users. I just don't understand why the platform well, of the people... Well, if you want it... If you want it to be the platform of the users, you need to get the community-built uh, ROMs rather than the ones that come from the manufacturer because well, the manufacturer's interest is making money, not helping you. Hold that thought one second because yep. I know some people out there can't root and can't replace their ROM. Uh -huh. You might want to find out if this is installed. So that's where my Android pick this week comes in. It's from the people that make Lookout Security. They're, they're, they've released Carrier IQ Detector, and it's a simple app, and all you do is you just install that app, and then you run it on your device, and within about one second, it tells you if uh, you have Carrier IQ installed. Now, I have my uh, Samsung Galaxy Tab, the original 7-inch Samsung Galaxy Tab here. And uh, mm -hmm. I, thought, I, I thought I was in the clear. I, I checked my running processes. I didn't see anything like Carrier IQ or anything like that. Um, but I decided I'd download this app and try it anyways. And uh, sure enough, if you're watching the video version right now, I'm displaying it. My, my Samsung Galaxy Tab 7 has Carrier IQ installed. Hmm. So, uh, you know, there you go. Um, I didn't know. Now I you thought figure I had to get it off there. I thought I didn't have it, um, but uh, according to this, uh, and then they talk about, uh, you know, your different options here, but it's really, it's overall, it's a, it's a big sales pitch for, for, for Carrier IQ, but uh, mm -hmm. 
I don't know. It, it might be something you guys want to check out. So it's a free app, and I put a link to that in the show notes, and uh, you just can load it and run it on your device. Now, um, the reality is, is the people who are the safest here are the individual users who actually own their Android device and have replaced the stock ROM with a community ROM or have at least rooted it so that way they can get administrative level access to the hardware that they own. Yep. Um, you know, that, this is the best example of why users should have administrative rights over the hardware and devices that they own. Because mm -hmm. since we don't, you literally can't go in there and stop the service. You can't turn it off. There's no user controllable way to turn off Carrier IQ unless you replace the ROM. And I think as the educated users that we are and, and the Linux Action Show viewers are, I think we have to get s more serious about supporting community ROMs and pushing people to replace their ROM on their phone. Almost like yep. with the passion level that we used and we still do, it seems to have faded, but we still, you remember like people were really obsessed with converting folks off of Windows onto Linux. That was like, that was like a question we would get several times a week. How, what's the best way to go about it? That has slowed down. And maybe people are giving up a little bit, but there's still a need out there for that kind of activism. And in this case, in this case, people just have to take ownership over their own devices. This is yep. just, I mean, I am, I am furious. Because now that I'm using this as my main phone, too, I'm furious yep. that they're tracking everything I do. And I don't do anything that I wouldn't want them to know about. But it makes me so Still angry. creepy, right? <laughs> exactly. All right. So that's, uh, that's our rant on Carrier IQ. Let's move on. Let's, talk, uh, let's shift gears and get to heavy into desktop Linux for a second to sort of shake off all that negativity. There's yep. been a lot of talk these recent days about how uh, Ubuntu might be declining in popularity and Mint is soaring. And this is a perfect topic since we're reviewing Mint 11 this week. And uh, some different articles have been published. I picked this one this week that I like the best. It came from Starry Hope, or Starry Hope, however you want to say it. And uh, he throws off a few different ways to gauge distro popularity. Because, you know, there's, there's no surefire way to know what Right, because, are. you know, downloads don't necessarily mean anything if people keep downloading it over and over again and so on. And oh, I guess I said Mint 11. I meant Mint 12. All right, right. so this guy has, has put together a pretty good collection of different data resources to try to prove the point that Ubuntu is probably still the most popular Linux distribution out there and that Mint hasn't clobbered it. Now, uh, the Jupyter Broadcasting uh, web stats would would show the same. But he, he first starts out by saying, you know, if you go by DistroWatch's numbers, remember, DistroWatch counts just by people visiting that page. Uh, Linux Mint is number one. But when you actually look at things like the Alexia ranking and, and the Netcraft ratings, uh, the Ubuntu web page is, is higher. Okay, I'll, I'll give him that. What I thought was interesting is he actually looked at blogging trends, like what people are actually writing about. Mm -hmm. And he compared Ubuntu, Linux Mint, and CentOS. And Ubuntu is this blue line here in the video version is significantly higher than all of the other distros combined. Like the amount of people, what people are talking about, is is, is it does have more like brand recognition in right. the in the and the uh, Google search know. trends kind of back that up too. He show, he goes on yeah. then to show the the kind of match the uh, the blogging trends. Well, a lot of people that I wouldn't say are power users, they're just I don't, maybe slightly advanced users at least have heard of Ubuntu and know what it is. They might not have even heard of Mint, and they might not even be big Linux users, but they know what it is. So when they hear it mentioned, they, they right. have that recognition. He also compares search, search terms for all top 10 other distros on DistroWatch versus Ubuntu, and Ubuntu still clocks them. He, he then compares uh, Ubuntu and Linux together, and they've almost, they've almost sandwiched together. And then the other thing that I think might actually have, there's two things that might actually have some credence um, just based on what I've kind of noticed, too, when I gauge these things, is Twitter um, almost has no conversation going on about Linux Mint, Debian, Fedora, OpenSUSE. But part of that, I imagine, is that the type of people who sure, chatter point. all day on Twitter are probably not the same people that use Linux. Maybe, because that, that, might, that might also back up the Facebook stats here. He shows on Facebook that... Uh, uh, you know, you look how many people have shared the, the, the Ubuntu page. 83,000 people have shared that page versus, say, the Linux Mint page, which clocks in at 7,000, Fedora at 6, and Debian at 3,000. Right. Um, and, but those are, you know, Ubuntu have been around for how many years longer, right? So that even I agree. If, if it gets this. So part of like what we see on DistroWatch, it probably is that the growth of Mint is at right. a higher rate people than People are the getting more and more Ubuntu. interested. I think DistroWatch is a better representation of people's. Uh, change of, in interest than it is the actual the trend deployment. And, and what's happening like right now, not what's happened over the last year. What, what's yeah, what, or yeah the last what's actually years. installed versus what people are reading about are two different things. Yeah, yes, I agree. that too. Uh, all right, 
Next story is uh, an update on the Barnes & Noble epic battle against Microsoft. Barnes & Noble yes. is going up and trying to uh, defend users against Microsoft's anti-competitive behaviors against Android. And Barnes & Noble is playing a little dirty. I love it. The yep. good kind of dirty. Uh, Barnes & Noble has hired a very special legal representative for their new case. He, uh, he was the chairman of Boys and & Schiller and Florlax. Philanaxar. It's really, it's a crazy word, you guys. Look, <laughs> F-L-E-X-N-E-R, law firm. Uh, he, this law firm represented the U.S. Department of Justice back during the turn of millennium during the Microsoft antitrust trial. There and, you go. Uh, so the guy that, prosec- that was, uh, that was uh, prosecuting for the government against Microsoft is now working for Barnes & Noble against their uh, patent, you know, against their uh, patent lawsuit yes, with Microsoft. Because Microsoft is trying to claim that they, they own the patent on a progress bar to tell you that a website is loading, even though that existed before the patent. Right, right. Or that, you know, the idea of loading pictures in the background uh, on a website. For that one, I can't figure out how else you would load a picture. Like, uh, what other way is there to load a picture except for, like, in line? I know. Uh, I really, I don't, I don't get how that works. The, the, uh, the patent system is so broken. Um, yes. <clears throat> the number one voted... Uh, story on the uh, Linux Action Show subreddit, which thank you everyone who goes to uh, Reddit or linuxactionshow.reddit.com and votes there. The number one of the number one stories is Mark Shuttleworth's rant against the patent system. So if you want to read that, uh, go check out linuxactionshow.reddit.com and, and vote for a story while you're there. All right. The next story uh, is about potential rocky times for Firefox, which is probably one of the most wildly successful open source projects mm-hmm. of the last 10 years. Um, and it could be fans fi- facing some financial trouble. You know, I think a lot of people are aware that Firefox gets a lot of its financing through a search rev share deal with Google. Yep. And uh, as as of actually, as a matter of fact, it's not just a lot of their money. Uh, it, it's like it actually eighty five percent or something. Yeah, like it's eighty four percent in two thousand ten of Mozilla's one hundred and twenty three million in revenue came directly from Google. Yep. So uh, the issue is is that uh, that search deal, that rev share deal, expired in November. Yep. And uh, Ed Bot over at uh, ZDNet reached out to Mozilla to try to get an update to see if they had renewed the deal. And Mozilla says they don't have any, uh, anything to announce update. at this time. Yeah, uh, An 85% revenue loss for Firefox. Right. And, you that know, seems pretty it made, critical. It made sense for Google to do it back then because as people finally got out of, you know, Internet Explorer into a, a standard compliant browser, they needed a default search engine, right? And... You know, but now Google has so much market share, people are going to go to Google no matter what, I imagine. Uh, I, I do anyway. But, I wouldn't um, be too surprised if Google wouldn't work out another deal with Firefox. Well, because well, now they have as much market share as Firefox yes. in their own Chrome browser. Chrome, and yeah. there's, you know, now but that they have that, it makes Google, they don't need it. Google, I think, is, is at, at its core, Google will sometimes do things that are better for the web than they are for Google. And yeah. I say a lot of nasty things about Google, but that one thing does always appear to ring true is a lot of times they will act with the web's best interest because they believe, you know, but a stronger if, web is better for Google. It, exactly. So you know, m- rather than it, taking a bit of extra money now, they invest in making the Internet better and more powerful so that in the future there's 10 times as much business for them to take. I mean, Google would want any web browser to have its default search to be Google. So I think they'll probably mm-hmm. strike another deal with Mozilla, but I bet, they, I bet be it's not smaller. such a sweetheart deal this time. Yeah, hopefully it and works out though. The, the, you know, part of it is you know has uh, over time has Firefox got a little too bureaucratic in the fact that they can manage to spend 123 million dollars. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it's an open source project. You can hire a hell of a lot of developers for that, and they seem to have a lot of administrators and you know business type people, and maybe they don't need so many of those. Yeah, you know their uh, their responses in in Edbot's article on ZDNet are. Uh, it's funny you say the bureaucratic thing because they reek of bureaucrat. I mean, it is so bad. Like, they all of their answers are non-answers, and I, it just it it kind of kills me a little bit on the inside that software that was a web browser can just become perverted into just another slow-moving company. Even even stuff like that. But we'll see. Maybe maybe things will get turned around. And they still you know maybe maybe this will make them uh, you know tighten up their belt and, and get back Maybe. to the basics of developing a really good web browser. Yeah, yeah. All right, now this next story is uh, not quite news yet, but that's not too uncommon. I, I, every now and then, I like to go out on a search and try to find an open source project that's sort of right at the crest of either 
really taking off and developing into something big, or it could fade away. And uh, this week, in my searches led me to something pretty cool called DebTorrent. Not brand, brand new, but it's sort of been restructured and refocused. So it, it showed up on my radar again. And uh, DebTorrent is, you can probably guess by the name, it's, it's, they're trying to come up with a way to use apt over BitTorrent. So that way they can, you know, take care of some of the things like overburdened mirrors. And they go on to talk about how... Uh, well, yeah, because a lot of these open source projects, uh, because they're not as commercially adopted or educationally adopted as like, you know, the Linux kernel itself or FreeBSD get a lot of uh, mirrors and stuff hosted by universities and big companies that, and like internet hosting companies that can donate it. Yeah. But, you know, if you're the Debian project, you maybe don't quite have as many of those because you're not as commercially popular as Red Hat or whatever. And they go on to say or, in, their, the, in this, art, in this uh, write-up here on the, on the project page, they talk about how uh, some, some mirrors for whatever reason through the community just became more popular and so they kind of get a higher load and this would yeah. sort of help to reduce that but using BitTorrent actually has a lot of um, surprising downsides that they have to work around and that's what made this really interesting to me first of all uh, BitTorrent has a minimum file size of 32 kilobytes you can't, you can't torrent hmm. something smaller than 32 kilobytes and very often there could be meta packages or, or a delta package or something that's smaller than 32 kilobytes so they have to work around just that right there uh, the other yeah. thing is the mirrors could update faster than the people who are seeding the, the torrents could respond to them, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of these little issues that they think that they can work through if they maybe set up some sort of torrent well, proxy system that App would talk to. And so it would sort of possibly. manage it, and then uh, App would sort of be a client to that. Torrents have always had, like, the way torrents were originally designed, there's HTTP seeds. The idea was you have a big file you post on your website, and you include the URL to that in your torrent, and then when the swarm starts, people download it from your website, and then the peers keep exchanging bits to, make, to boost the speed of your website. Now, they would probably have some issues, like the chat room is bringing up about IRC throttling, or ISP throttling, but um, y you would hope that maybe if this took off widely, uh, people would maybe start to realize, and I think you're starting to see it, that BitTorrent isn't only used for pirating. Like, right, because it's used for patches for games like WoW. Dude, we're, and we have people in the live chat room right now that are seeding the uh, Linux Mint Torrent that we're going to give out yes. later today. I mean, I've, I've, uh, my server has uploaded uh, 7 gigabytes of the torrent already. Since we've just started the show. And yeah. you know, that's all legitimate uses of, of distributing something. So, uh, this, I think this, is what, this is exactly what torrents were invented yeah, for, for yeah. seeding ISO images and and other, you know, legitimate things that open source projects couldn't do by themselves because well, it also costs money. It removes dependence for the open source projects. They're not, they're, you know, they're not, they don't, they don't have to rely on those, on those volunteered mirrors, and those mirrors don't have the burden as well. So, yeah. and you could still have, you know, mirrors. Some mirrors act as supersedes or something like that. So, yep. you know, they'd still be a role for them. Right, and and I think that, well, that was the way torrents were designed was to have mm -hmm. this regular method of getting the file and then boosting the speed of that. Uh, with the torrent swarm, so right. like uh, the way the, it was the original like proof of concept for it, I think used a web server where each user was limited to 128 kilobytes per second from the the website, so that one user couldn't use up all the bandwidth on the website. Sure. And then the swarm would allow them to boost that speed by everybody who downloading it would share. And now you know HTTP can do uh, ranges where you can say you know don't give me the start of the file, give me start from the end, right. of the, the middle of the file or whatever. Right. And if different people grab different parts of the file, then it seeds out the torrent. It gets that distributed number up, and then everybody can go. Um, now this last story on the news docket, you slipped in there right before the show started, yes. so I'll throw to you. Uh, tell me about this because it looks kind of positive, right? Am I? Is this yes. a good thing? Uh, I think so. Um, the intro version Humble Bundle uh, it has been on sale for a little while now, yep. uh, and Linux is doing a very good job of As uh, donating a lot more money than Windows and Mac users do. Um, but it includes all the uh, everybody's favorite intro version games like Uplink, the hacking simulator, yes. uh, DEFCON, the thermonuclear war simulator, uh, Darwinia and Multiwinia, and a bunch of other stuff. But uh, some of those games are kind of old now, and Introversion doesn't want them to just die. So... They've decided that if you buy the Humble Bundle, they will also give you the source code and SVN access. That is awesome. Yes. Now, because they already have uh, some licensing agreements in place with, uh, like, one company bought the rights to make uh, an Xbox version of some of these games, they can't just open source the code. 
Uh, oh, okay. So there are some restrictions, and I've linked to the license. Uh, but basically, you can make a patch that you can distribute, uh, but you can't make binaries uh, for new platforms. Oh, okay. If you do uh, port it to some platform that they don't already have licensed, uh, they're willing to work out a deal with you where they will actually pay you royalties and everything. Uh, but That's if awesome. you want to do binaries, you kind of have to talk to them and, and make a deal first. So uh, just before we wrap here, I'll cover the uh, I'll cover the contributions because this is always our favorite part here on Linux Action Show. Mm -hmm. uh, the average purchase price is four dollars and eleven cents. The average Windows user spent three dollars and forty four cents. The average Mac user five dollars eighty five cents, and the average Linux user eight dollars and sixty five cents. That's yep. awesome. And look, you've got Go Linux up there at number four. And I think like last year, didn't we have a Linux Action Show submission? Or last, not last year, just last like the last a couple bundle. weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah, just a few weeks ago, a Linux has now swept this hum humble bundle every time. Yeah. It's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, yep. it's also and a great yes, buy. All of, these, all of these games work on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes and of the chat room. I'm, going to, I'm trying to organize a six-player DEF CON game for after the show. So if you want to play, stick around. <laughs> awesome, dude. And right I on. will nuke your face. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'll put a link to uh, the humble bundle in the chat room in case somebody wants yep. to go... Uh, Put another, uh, put another check in the Linux. And column. that deal's only open for two more days, so you got to hurry up. Yeah, dude, seriously. All right, man, well, with all that news out of the way, let's move into the Mint 12 review. <laughs> and it's time to review Linux Mint 12. I think a lot of you out there probably know I've been waiting to get to this one. Alan, what, do I talk about Mint like every episode? I seem to find a way to Basically, work it in yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Linux, you know, Linux Mint, um, I have a long history with it, but uh, mm -hmm. it, this week I thought its real challenger is going to be the new OpenSUSE release, because that was such a solid release, that 12.1, um, right? 12.1, yeah, because they skipped a version. Uh, so let's start, with, uh, let's start with Linux Mint's um, unique approach with this one, is uh, they're supporting really, in my mind, two desktops. Um, mm -hmm. The GNOME 3 environment, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and the mate environment, which uh, I'll talk about. And the mate environment is uh, the no is essentially gnome to um, forked, and then say we're, we're put a stake in the ground. Say we're going to take this gnome source and we're going to continue gnome on and uh, make mate its own separate desktop. Now uh, the, the Linux Mint folks made kind of a big stink about trying to alter GNOME 3 in a way so that it was a little more conventional, a little yep. more of a traditional desktop OS. And they did that with their MGSE, which is a series of different uh, extensions and additions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I'm yep. showing it here on the... Yeah, because I don't version. actually know what it is. So Okay. So uh, MGSE, very simply put, is a collection of different things that they're doing. But the most prominent one is they've added uh, a Mint menu to GNOME 3. It looks a lot kind of like the GNOME menu they had for the old version. And traditionally, GNOME doesn't have a menu or even an app list bar down here at the bottom, right? That's, that's also been added by them. That's not a traditional thing nice. for GNOME. Uh, and they, have, uh, they also have the standard GNOME menu where you have that big all full screen window that you can search or you can browse through the list of applications and, and pick. And they've, they've altered this a little bit too. They have a series of extensions. The, the main extensions that I've noticed is they have the, the GNOME 3 menu extension. They have yep. the media player extension, which lets you manage your uh, media player in the uh, GNOME menu and uh, up in the volume control, sort of like you could do on, uh, the, uh, on Unity. Uh -huh. And okay. uh, they, they also uh, they give you this tool, and let me see if I can find it here. It's a tool that lets you customize GNOME and, and turn on and off the different levels of integration with MGSC that you might want. And I, I think it's, it's sort of a stopgap method until GNOME itself uh, offers up these kinds of enhancements directly, because to be honest, it's one mm -hmm. of those things that you really shouldn't have to have. Um, Okay, so that's, that's, boy, there's not a lot I have to say about GNOME 3 because GNOME 3 is GNOME 3. What yep. Mint has done here is they've added little things to make it just a more usable experience. Like, Alan, I'll give you an example. They've replaced mm -hmm. the regular user menu with a uh, menu that gives you more options that it's like fundamentally just a little more convenient, and that's what really matters. Uh, like this yep. little toggle switch right here. Toggle off notifications. And now guess what? Now I don't have to get all these obnoxious notifications going. Uh, well, yeah, if you're trying to concentrate on something, you don't mm -hmm. want to see every little pop-up. Or, uh, you know, some people are having trouble with, I think, Unity, where the notifications were stealing focus from what they were trying to do. And here's, example, here's, a, here's a great example of the design philosophy difference between, say, Fedora and Linux Mint. There's a shutdown option in that menu. 
in, in Fedora's implementation of GNOME, you can't even shut down from inside GNOME. You have to log out and then shut down, right? And, and that's just crazy. That that's doesn't just crazy. make very much sense. A, and, extra steps and extra waiting for no reason. But right. B, on most systems, you have to be logged in in order to order a shutdown. Yeah, yeah. Now <laughs> right? the, it's, it's a privileges thing. The uh, well, um, Mint, Mint 11 or Mint 12 ships with Firefox 701. It uses Banshee as its uh, media player, Banshee 2.2. Uh, Pigeon 2.1 is its chat program. It's a little program. weird that it's an older version of Firefox, but I guess it was yeah, right about yeah. the same launch date. So, But let's talk about the, the reason why I'm not, I'm not all excited as, as I thought it would be about the GNOME 3. It's okay, but in VirtualBox, I had some rendering issues with that menu, and on my laptop, I had s different rendering issues. In your, your VirtualBox, were you using 3D acceleration? Yeah, like, yeah were you, you using have the to. 3D or the fallback? You so. have to to get the full GNOME 3. And that's actually, right. that's actually a good perk of Mint 12 is out of the box, in VirtualBox, it's the full 3D environment. You don't go back to that older style. Um, and on my, la on my laptop, I have an ATI, like Radeon 58, something in there. And there's just like a little graphics issue with the fonts and whatnot. And I think mm -hmm. there's an ATI driver update that takes care of it. I'm not sure it's actually a Mint issue. But um, let's, let's talk about uh, Mate because Mate mm -hmm. was... Honestly, the walkaway surprise. The way Mint pitches Mate is they give you a big fat warning in the release notes say it's not ready for general use. It's still under rapid development. We're working with the Mate project to make this better, so don't put your expectations too high. And that's, okay, probably a safe thing to, to put out there, but uh, when I logged into to Mate, uh, I, it was like coming home for Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, it yep. was like I'm home again. It's, it behaves and performs beautifully. It yeah. looks great. It's just and it it's is, exactly it's what you're used to. <laughs> it's everything I'm used to, just slightly updated. And and mm -hmm. I can't underestimate how pleasant that is to have that available as an option. Now, GNOME three, yep. this definitely seems like the best implementation of GNOME three I've seen yet. And I really honestly mean that. I want you guys to go download this Mint Virtual Box and check it out. I think you'll be impressed with how well they've integrated uh, the MGSC stuff with GNOME three. But the big complaint I have heard is Mint is turning into Ubuntu with GNOME 3 extensions pre-installed. I think that's a little unfair because Mint also uh, replaces... I, a lot of other things. Yeah, they have a lot of other tools in here like uh, their, own, their own package manager and uh, you know, other little, little niceties and tools that they've added. But because it's based on Ubuntu, it's always going to have that. True. That. But what if they go... Be what, if, what, if they, what if Mate takes off? What yeah. if... What if Linux Mint 12 sees a big popularity increase because Mate is actually workable. Now, it's yeah. not problem-free. I don't mean to pitch Mate as this without-issue uh, desktop because, <laughs> like, you can run into issues just by changing themes sometimes. But yeah. when it... Honestly, I had less issues with Mate than I had with GNOME 3. And is it possible for Mint to pull ahead by more hanging on to the past? differentiate itself more by going... Yeah, I think so, because... I don't know about everybody else, but a lot of people like me are perfectly happy with what they're used to rather than something new. Now, check this out. Uh, the uh, Nautilus is replaced by Kaja or something like this. There's, a f there's, there's differences. There are, there's differences, but it's, it's functional. I mean, they're, they're making a like, fork here. So. Sometimes one questions whether those differences are just to set themselves apart and not necessarily for the better, hmm. uh, but most of them seem to be for the better, and I think, hmm. you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, I... I would say my, my, my takeaway from this was, uh, you know, a lot of the small things that I would have issues with, like the brightness controls in, uh, in, in Fedora, the brightness controls were, just didn't work at all, even though the, the status bar would, would be updated, right? But yep. I, the, but the backlighting on my LCD would not change. In OpenSUSE, the lighting the would opposite, change, right? but the status bar wouldn't change. <laughs> yeah. In Mint 12, guess what? They both work. There you um, go. Mint 12 is also one of the few distros, aside from OpenSUSE, they just out of the box during the installer, detected my wireless Broadcom card, and got it working. Ah. And Mint also advertises the fact that they come preloaded with codecs and Flash and all the things that users want out of the box. So, like, I don't right. even have to, they're not, like... They're not ahead. necessarily about, you know, the evangelizing certain things. They're about making a desktop that just works for people. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And it, it's, it, it, I believe that means they come from a completely different approach. Yeah, if if you're trying to come with the approach of steal Windows market share, then that's the approach you have to take. It has to just work kind of thing. I think that approach appeals to me more because it's, um, I feel like I'm not fighting ideology. I'm just using yeah. a really great desktop with the operating system I prefer, using the tools I prefer. And I don't want to get into the ideology if I should have MP3 codecs because I feel like 
We lost that debate years ago. And now all we're doing is just being stubborn. Even And, and I know there's legal, implication, legal ramifications there, but you see other distros do this too. And it, it totally removes that whole layer of, of getting up and, and going. Like, if you gave this to a family member over the holidays, you're not going to get that call the next day saying, I can't play any of my MP3s. It's just not going to, it's already taken care of. Yeah. And it's, the, it's that approach and that thoughtfulness that I think is, shows itself throughout Mint that I like a lot. Now, the other common complaint I heard was the theme is a little old, it's a little stale. Um, yeah, but if you're going with that, it's probably what you want. Like, you know, your machine doesn't have to look futuristic. It well, has to work. See, that's, I completely agree. I think, I think it implies stability, uh, polish, and uh, professionalism. They've, they've revved a few things. They've updated a few things. But for the most part, it's, you know, it's, it's the themes that have already worked and been established as, as uh, you know, people like them. And they have a yeah. clean look to them. It's like, I don't know about other people's desktop, but I have a plain, solid color background and a very basic set of icons and menus. Like, I, I don't, I'm not looking for, you know, transparencies and glowing this and shiny that and 3D and things like that. I just right. want to get my work done. Right. Yep. Yep. So, the Mate and Gnome 3 both ship on the DVD. So, at the login screen, you can just flip between the two and, and experiment with them. Uh, the chat room mentions, you know, why would you stick with Mate when you can go XFCE? And... I'm with you on that. I, I, I well, think it's an interesting but if horse you're, race if thing. You're just, if you're used to GNOME and you just want to keep having GNOME 2 style, then think that's about, what you want. Right? Think about the corporate deployment options with me, exactly, right? Exactly, too. They, they, why would, there's, I, don't, I don't see GNOME 3 as going over well in a corporate IT and deployment, uh, whereas no. Mate, you know, the users can just kind of stick with what they know. Exactly. And it worked for me. I was surprised. I honestly was surprised how at ease I felt once I logged into Mate. I think I've felt like I've been living on this island of forcing myself to use desktops. And XFCE has gotten the closest, but this is the real deal. Um, and it's done well, and the codecs are in there, and everything works out of the box. I mean, Mint 12 is one of those distributions where you can just give it to somebody and you can leave it alone, and it's not really a tinkerer's distribution. And right. I think that's why it doesn't always appeal to a, a vast majority of Linux Action Show audiences. You're not tinkering with this thing. Arch right. is more for tinkering. Yeah, but if, if you're trying to, you know, set a machine up for your mom or your grandma to do their basic internet browsing and email and stuff without getting viruses, then Mint is more likely to, to just work for them. Yeah. Now, the other thing that's interesting about Mint is their uh, integration with DuckDuckGo, and they have a rev share deal. They're hoping to earn some revenue there. I mean, sounds like that worked pretty well for Firefox, so maybe it'll work well mm. for the Mint guys. And the other thing is, of course, Mint is community-funded. And yep. uh, it, I don't know, I just... I just I love it. I love that it's a community-based distribution that has the user in mind that is producing one of the most polished desktops out there. I think yep. I think this is a this is a clear winner and it gives a clear path of exit for Ubuntu Unity users who are upset because it's based on Ubuntu, which means all of the guides and tutorials and how-tos out there that work for Ubuntu work on Mint. All of the PPAs that are out there generally always work on Mint. So there's a massive software library out there, a massive how-to guide library out there, and you but you don't actually have to use Ubuntu to take advantage of them. Yep. Uh, so it, there's definitely an audience this Mint 12 appeals to, and right now it's staying as my distro of choice. I, I, don't, I don't really foresee another distro coming along and knocking off its perch. That said, I've committed to trying ArchBang, so maybe we'll see. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll see. But right now, Mint 12 for me, where I'm in the, I'm, I've got a lot of work to do. I want a reliable desktop Linux that works the way I want it to work, that I know how to use it, I'm efficient at, and I can just install it and go. Uh, I just don't see how you can have a better fit than Mint 12 for that for that. Scenario. Right, like th that's that's what a, an operating system and a desktop should be: is get out of my way and let me get my work done, not shiny this and notification that and and so on. Now, on, as far as the so it's not all gushing. Uh, as far as the negative angles go on Mint 12, uh, I I do agree with the consensus in the chat room. There has been. Um, you know, like the menu issues I've had. Uh, I've had some issues where the VirtualBox uh, 3D driver flips in and out of operation. Haven't had that issue on physical hardware. But that means I don't always get the GNOME 3 desktop when I log in. I kind of flip-flop right. between them. So, and there's already been a couple of big updates and an, and an ATI driver update. I would, say, I would say my general recommendation is download the Linux Action Show Torrent. That we have a link in the show notes. Try it out. If you're going to put it on physical hardware you might give it another week or two for some more updates to come out. I have all the faith in the world that the Mint 12 guys will, will sort of polish any rough edges. They're there. There are a few rough edges, um, but, you know, for the... Okay, I'll give you an example. Um, 
I was installing, and I have a I have a very small SSD in my laptop, and then I have a very large I have a 500 gigabyte uh, hard drive. I have two I have two hard drives in this laptop, because yeah, it's a big it's a big beast, and mm -hmm. uh, it let me the partitioner let me set up my root partition on my SSD drive where there wasn't enough space for the entire install. It didn't warn me. I was kind of testing to see if it would. It didn't warn me to let me proceed until the very end of the installation when it ran out of hard drive space and the installer crashed. <laughs> and I just got a, hey, sorry, the installer crashed. And I had to do it over again. And I would assume if I would have rebooted my box, it probably would have been in a bootable state, e either for either uh, yeah. the previous operating system or that one. The other thing is they've kind of, they've kind of lazed out a little bit um, when uh, it comes to the automatic partitioner. Like... Uh, OpenSUSE's automatic partitioning tool is just so damn slick. It, first of all, does a great sophisticated partitioning layout. It takes advantage of, of ButterFS or LVM, and, and it also gives you a great display of what it's going to do. The Linux Mint 12 partitioner gives you two options, custom partitioning or delete everything on the hard drive, including any other operating system you might have like Windows, and just install Mint 12. I realize that's easier for them to support, but it felt like they weren't... I know they could do better with that tool, and they weren't. But again, you know, it's not the Tinkerer's OS. It's so either, you know, you're setting it up for your mom, or your mom's converting an old computer, right? Right, right. And like Haiku user says in the chat room, because Mate is a little unpolished, and because GNOME 3 is a little unpolished, ergo Linux Mint 12 will be a little unpolished. And I think that is really what it is. It's based on a great storable, stable core, uh, if you're a Debian fan and Ubuntu fan, you know, he's got everything there for you. And the, the user layer just needs needs a little more tweaks. It needs a little more polish, but they're doing it. Yeah. So there so, you go. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so like we said, a link in the show notes to download the torrent as well as some notes and uh, links to other reviews. I've included also more information on the Mate desktop as well as the extensions that are used in the GNOME 3 desktop because that's really some of the secret sauce on uh, on Mint 12 here is uh, some of these uh, some of these great extensions that they've added that the other distros the other distros don't have like oh I don't know you know it's nice desktop icons for example isn't that novel how about that mm -hmm. there's an example of something they added to make GNOME 3 a little more usable there you have it everyone yep. that's the Linux Action Show's review of Mint 12 and that brings us to the end yeah. of this week's broadcast yay that's a big show it was a fun it was show a good Alan. show. Yep. Now, a uh, couple of points of business. It is getting to be the holiday season, and you can support the network just by doing your standard, regular old holiday shopping. That's if, what uh, I did. Yeah. D go ahead. Tell us about what you did, Alex. Yes. That's awesome. So uh, I was doing some holiday shopping, and I went over to ThinkGeek, and uh, I used the affiliate link uh, from Jupiter Broadcasting. And so when I bought my, did all my purchases, uh, Jupiter Broadcasting gets an affiliate commission. didn't cost me anything extra. I got great gifts from ThinkGeek, and Jupiter That's Broadcasting cool. gets a cut. Yep, we'll put a link to that, that in in the show notes. All you do is, oh yeah, there's. I love that shirt. That you, did you get that using the affiliate? Uh, well, no, I bought I bought this one years ago. Oh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I bought a new shirt and uh, I got gifts from my sister, my mom, my dad, <laughs> my aunt, a bunch of other oh, people. Oh man, it's gonna be a gift have, Christmas. You know, it's not just. You know, some of the stuff is just not necessarily geeky, but just fun, cool, fun. like uh, good gifts. They do. I'll spoil gifts. it for my sister, but I got her. Uh, Electronic bubble wrap. Yeah. It's a yeah. keychain with yeah. bubbles on it, and you yeah. just pop the bubble wrap forever. And she loves bubble wrap, so That's it's awesome. a, a great little stocking <laughs> stuff for gift. Yeah, we have, um, we have links to Amazon and ThinkGeek in the Linux Action yep. Show show notes. If you just click those links, then your entire browsing and shopping session is attributed to uh, Jupyter Broadcasting. Also, yep. if you just go to the bottom, the very, very bottom of the Jupyter Broadcasting website, we have a There's link a nice down there. link to Amazon. Amazon. Yeah, you just click that, and then your entire shopping session will, uh, will be tagged. And yep. that's it's honestly uh, how I'm going to afford my Christmas shopping this year. So thank you to everyone who does that. Um, yep. That is literally... That is literally how I'm affording any Christmas gifts at all this year. Um, and then also, the Jupiter Signal should be launching on Wednesday of this week, nice. which uh, is exciting. The first issue of the Jupiter Signal, you still have a chance to sign up if you want that. Go over to bit.ly slash Jupiter Signal, or just sign up. There's a spot in the show notes where you can plug your email address in. Promise we never spam. Mm -hmm. Never, because otherwise uh, MailChimp comes and sends very angry monkeys over to the studio. Yeah. Alan, is there any other business you think we should attend to? Uh, no, I think that's about it. All right, well, there you have it. So the Linux Action Show is live over at jblive.tv on 10 a.m. Pacific on Sundays, which is what, Eastern, Alan? Uh, 1 p.m. There you go. There you go. I was like, dude, just look at the clock. <laughs> and, well, uh, it's, it's 
14, 18 now. Well, yeah, I know. We've been doing a show for a little while. I know, I know. Um, and then uh, you, so you can join us at jblive.tv. 1800 UTC. Also, if you want to give us some feedback, we have a feedback episode coming up. Uh, you can just leave a comment anywhere you watch yep. this. I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of the reviews we've done recently. I feel like we've been going through review after review after review. We're done now for a while. We've got some more stuff planned, but uh, we'll have a feedback episode to kind of wrap it all up in a little while. So leave a comment or email linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com or head over to Jupiter Colony where you can join the, the, uh, the forum over there and, and engage the community. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in this week, everyone. And don't forget, the Linux Action Show will be back on Sunday, but we will be taking some time off in the holidays. We will. That yes. is, I think I think sort of like towards Christmas. So go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Right. Well, because the, the one episode lands on Christmas Day, so yeah. that one will obviously be gone. Yeah. So. yeah. So don't forget about that calendar, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. That's where we have all that. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, and we'll see you right back here next week. Yeah.